evening. Um, we are over at the parsonage tonight. And the reason is because uh, it's icy outside. And uh, rather than take the risk of running off the road or something, just trying to get a mile up the road to the church, we just decided to have the Bible study here from the parsonage. So uh, if you remember the original Bible studies before we started over at the office, why you remember the uh, cuckoo clock and all of these other things that sit behind me. So here they are. Um, anyway, uh, we're still on the study guide, the three-page study guide that uh, we've been on for the last couple of, of um, Bible studies. And we are down at the bottom of the first page at question number two. So kind of give you a clue as to where we are. And uh, while you are tuning in, I invite you to sign in on the comments section. Say howdy to us. Um, even if you don't want to say howdy, take two seconds and click on like or click on share maybe even and share this on your Facebook page. We would love to see you. Hi, Daryl. Welcome. Good to see you. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, have a prayer together and then get started. Okay? So let's go ahead and have prayer. Father in heaven, how wonderful it is to be called by your name. O oh Lord, that we were right and deserving of this grace, but then it would no more be grace, would it? O oh Lord, that we could, that we could uh, somehow earn your favor, but then it would be no more mercy. Father, you are a merciful God. And you are a gracious God. And our reading of your word and our study of your word is a privilege that you've given to us. For centuries, men would have loved to have had the written word of God in a book form that they could purchase at a store and read, but we've only had it in our language, really, for a little over 400 years, close to 500 years. And uh, this is a privilege that we don't even seem to understand. And already men are trying to rid the world of the Bible and rid the world of, of its truth. And they have been trying to suppress your word all along, but to have your word written and to be able to study it. God, what a privilege you've given to us. Oh, that we might take full advantage of it tonight and that you might give us full advantage of your word. Help us, Lord, I pray, to learn and to grow. Be with us, Lord, for our flesh is weak even when our spirits are willing. We need you more than we need anything else. Thank you, Lord, so much for the gift of life. Help us now, Lord, I pray, to learn more about the one that gave it to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm glad to see others that have uh, signed on and said hello. Um, it's uh, good to see uh, Joe, and looks like uh, looks like uh, Roy. Daryl said uh, good evening instead of just nine, which that was kind of nice. That's a G. Is that a G? Ah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a G. Well, my glasses are a little foggy, to be honest with you. Um, I'm just going to take care of that matter real quick. Anyways, it's a little more clear. Um, we're going to pick up at uh, question number two, and um, that will be uh, Matthew chapter uh, 9, verse 27, to start with going down through verse 34. Here we go. As Jesus went on from there, 
Two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the... Uh, I'm looking at NIV. Hang on just a second. I want to change back because I've been doing this in King James. And uh, I think I'd better just go ahead and continue to uh, stay in the same version of the Bible. So, um, just a moment. Okay, it's loading up. Just a moment. Sorry about that, folks. I'm frozen? Am I frozen, folks? I mean, the outdoors is frozen, that's for sure. Okay, moving on. Here we go, back to verse 27. And when Jesus was departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come to the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this. And they said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith be it done unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all the country. As they went out, behold, uh, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of devils. Okay, so... Um, I'm interested in particular wording there in that one verse that makes me wonder about something. Um, anyways, uh, what two key phrases does Jesus speak to the blind men? There's two, two key phrases that he speaks to them that are recorded. Now, I don't believe they're recorded without reason. So, um, you know, Jesus doesn't, God said that, uh, or Jesus said that God has not wasted a jot or a tittle. Uh, so, every jot and tittle means something. Uh, we then must believe that the two phrases that Jesus said here are supposed to be um, material to us. Okay? So, first of all, he says, uh, Believe ye that I am able to do this. Now, remember that wherever you see ye in the King James Version, uh, that's the equivalent of the southern y'all. It means more than one person is being talked to. Okay? So, um, in southern, it would be, uh, be believe y'all that I'm able to do this. <laughs> okay? But uh, here, that's one of the key phrases. Now, the next key phrase here is, According to your faith, be it done unto you. That's the next key phrase. So we have two different phrases here, and we're supposed to gain from these. So let's ponder, first of all, that Jesus said to them, Believe ye that I am able to do this. Now, it seems to be a bit of a, uh, of a redundant question, because uh, these men came to Jesus asking for healing for their sight uh, they wanted to be healed Jesus moves them into a house I don't know where what house this is that he pushes them into but somehow he he kind of guides them into this house so they can have private and he asked them do you believe that I can do this now again it seems redundant because here uh, they have asked the Lord. And so if they asked the Lord, it would seem that it's an understood truth that they do believe that he can do this. Um, so his question uh, is not so much uh, aimed at 
the 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 belief that he that God, that Jesus has the capacity rather that uh, that Jesus has the capacity uh, in their regard. Um, it's one thing for us to hear stories about God doing things in other people's lives. It's a completely other thing when it is personal. Uh, when, when God has healed other people of blindness and deafness, uh, our first reaction is, yeah, well, he did it for them. But I don't think he would do it for me. Now, I don't know why we go that direction. It has something to do with the sin nature. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate because the Bible doesn't give us instruction into that. Uh, why it is that, that we fail to believe uh, when it comes to our own selves. We tend to believe stories told of people that lived long ago or far away or we may even know people that have experienced some kind of a miracle apart from medical intervention. Now, I'm not saying that medical intervention isn't miraculous. It is in its own sense. It's a providential miracle, though, rather than a supernatural miracle. And providential is just as important because, uh, the, in case you don't know providential, um, providence is the base word of that. The base word of prov providence is provide. And so if we uh, break the word down into its basics, then we understand that providential means that God is providing. So our reference to that provision of God is what we call providence in a noun form. And then providential uh, moves on a little bit further beyond that and basically says to describe what has happened we're saying that it is providential in other words it is evidence that God has provided or it is something God has provided and that is what the word providential means so there are providential miracles where God has provided things to us uh, and doctors, for instance, are a providential miracle. Uh, there were doctors all along. There have always been people that have tried their best to help other people medically. But if you take a look at today with the marriage of technology and medicine and uh, the discoveries that were made only in the last couple hundred years, uh, how fast and how... how uh, really at a breakneck speed um, medicine has evolved uh, we could only say that this is definitely a providential miracle because they could have easily done gotten this far in the uh, you know in Jesus's time if they had had the research that we have if there had been the scientific curiosities and the scientific curiosities uh, that uh, O. Newton and Pascal and, and Copernicus and others, uh, those scientific curiosities came about because their minds were open to a God that had created everything and their, their concept was that if God created everything, then there is order to everything. And if there is order to everything, why then that order should be able to be expressed in a consistent manner so that if we calculate and if we uh, research and if we discover, we might be able to figure out what all is part of the order of creation that God has made and there, thereby we ought to be able to figure out how to better take care of these bodies and uh, to better manage things like food and water and such. Um, you have, if you, study, if you study history, you have no idea how quickly uh, things developed since the time that Christianity was introduced into the Western culture. It's why the Western culture is so far beyond 
all other cultures. Now, I'm not saying that other cultures didn't have science or didn't come up with, uh, with some good scientific discoveries, but as far as the timing and as far as the volume of science that has been developed, it has been developed because of Christianity in the Western world. And if you take a look at when things began to uh, rapidly gain knowledge, it was uh, in the uh, around the same time of the um, establishment of Christendom. And um, this is not an argument for the Catholic Church necessarily, but it's not an argument against the Catholic Church either. Uh, when the Catholics were the only game in town as far as the church and as far as Christianity was concerned, uh, why there was uh, a lot of controversy within that movement. Uh, and there were some in that movement that were not Christians. And, uh, you know, Copernicus, for instance, you know, he, he read in the scripture that the Lord encompasses the earth round about. And so he said, round about? That means that the earth is round. And he looked up at the sun, saw that the sun was round, looked up the moon, saw that the moon was round, and reasoned, quite rightly so, that the earth was round. And, of course, he faced a lot of competition from people that uh, still adhered to old-time religions, uh, like the Greek religion and the Roman religion that had pretty much passed away, and uh, other religions that claimed such things as the earth being flat or or this this kind of thing held up by atlas standing on a turtle and all these kinds of kinds of uh, pictures that that the early ones came up with uh, these are not of course you know christian ideas and they're pagan ideas and uh, it's interesting that that uh, they're still calling good evil and evil good because they, I was just hearing today that that there's a, you know, and I, I suppose that I've always known this, but there's a movement that tries to blame Christianity for the fall of Rome and for the fall of science and such and such. It's ridiculous. It's not, if you look at the timing and you look at the placement, you look at the people that championed the early development of science as we know it today, you would see clearly that this is a, a grouping of Christians and and uh, the Renaissance really did nothing to improve science. Uh, the Renaissance really was much more of a return to uh, the Greek and Roman religious ideals which Christianity had pulled away from and had, because of pulling away from, had begun the development of Western society. Now, I know I'm kind of off on a bit of a tangent here but I just want us to to understand what this whole business of believing in Jesus is all about there's providence in this recent discussion I had about the development of science in Western uh, civilization is is partly that we have to believe not just not just in some supernatural touch from God but also in the providence of God uh, God has provided certain things for us, but God also provides himself. And uh, God is actually uh, providing himself in Christ at this particular time. So this question of do you believe that I can do this? Now very well, these two blind men must have thought that, that uh, Jesus was asking about capability and so they probably said, you know, in their own way of thinking, yes, I believe that you have the capability. They'd probably heard about different blind men that he had healed and, and different miracles that had occurred. And so, and so, you know, having simply said to themselves, well, certainly we believe in your capability, um, they weren't understanding the question, the connotation of the question that Jesus was asking which had had to do with uh you know do you believe that that i am capable in other words do you believe that god has given me 
the the ability and it's it, rather than simply do you believe that this is possible or do you believe that it could happen uh, do you believe that I personally am able to do this um, I know that maybe I'm I'm eh, you know kind of uh, drawing a little hairline here but this all has to bear on the next phrase that he says he says to them according to your faith it will be done so here he he kind of gives us an idea of why he asked the first question when he makes this statement according to your faith it will be done because they may be saying we know that you that you're capable or we, we've or they may be saying in their minds or their hearts well we've heard that you've done this for others and we're hoping you'll do it for us um, but the second key phrase is what gives us the understanding of the first question because like I said apart from the second phrase that first question just seems so redundant because they're asking him to do something so obviously they believe he can do it now earlier we talked about the provision of God the providence of God and here we're talking about faith okay so the question with regards to faith has to do with um, belief humility and repentance okay those are the three uh, the, the three um, factors of faith uh, if a person believes but has not humility there's no faith if a person believes and has humility but has no repentance there's no faith okay so a person could be humble but not believe you know could be could be repentant but know not what he's repentant of could just be like ready to repent just tell me what I did wrong and I'll repent of it um, but uh, here uh, we're looking at biblical faith we're not simply looking at uh, a mere belief we're not looking at um, a, a mere uh, arranging of the mind or rearranging of the education of the mind in order to believe something that you didn't previously believe uh, we're certainly not looking at the mystical faith which is the faith that says uh, that I believe that if I have enough faith and believe that my faith can do what my faith says it will do that I will produce this kind of a mystical power or release the power of God um, that's mystical that's mysticism it's not it's not biblical uh, this idea of believing in faith um, faith is not a power uh, if you have faith in something that doesn't give power to it uh, faith is not in the spoken word uh, so if you speak a word of faith uh, that's not going to do anything except tell me what it is that you think could happen or should happen or might happen or will happen even but it doesn't guarantee that any of that will happen okay the concept of faith here is the biblical concept okay the the Bible tells us regarding faith that it is to be sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see but in order to substantiate what the writer of Hebrews means by that in chapter 11 he goes through a whole list of faithful men from the Bible uh, starting with Abel going to Noah and then to uh, Abram and then to Moses and and such and he says in every one of those occasions God gave them a command they obeyed the command 
because they had faith in the God who gave the command. So their faith in every case resulted in obedience. Abel believed the testimony of his parents with regards to the garden, which no man was allowed to go back into. Abel uh, then offered a righteous sacrifice, and uh, Cain did not. And Abel's sacrifice was accepted because of his faith. Um, but how was that faith acted out? It was acted out in obedience. So Jesus says to these gentlemen, these two gentlemen, according to your faith it will be done. And what he means is according to your belief and humility and according to your repentance, it will be done. Now, why do men need repentance? Well, men need moral repentance. Uh, that is that men need to, uh, need to live better lives. They need moral repentance, and that's the repentance that John the Baptist preached. But men also need saving repentance, and that is to repent of their very nature. It doesn't mean to repent of the things the nature produces. It means to repent of their nature itself, of the sin nature, of the sin of Adam. And this is something that cannot be done without the help of God. Okay, so when he says to them, according to your faith it will be done, it is to say according to the measure of faith God has given you it will be done. Um, do they own faith? Well, they own moral repentance. And so to that degree they do own faith. Uh, they have they, they have the ability to repent of their immorality. They have the ability to humble themselves. They have the ability to believe. Okay, this is uh, held up in Paul's explanation of how people are saved. How can they believe in what they have not heard? How can they hear unless someone preaches? How can they preach unless someone is sent? So the beginning of it is that God has sent someone. The end of it is that they believe. And uh, the Bible tells us repeatedly, we need to believe. We need to believe. Uh, the ability to believe is in our hands. Uh, the ability to be humble is somewhat in our hands as well. But the ability to repent other than morally is not. So. So when we talk about the repentance of, uh, of faith, we are talking about uh, the ability to believe, which we have, the ability to be humble, which we have, uh, and the ability to repent morally, which we have. But to be saved, a person has got to uh, humble himself before the Lord and the nature of the person does not believe God by nature. The nature of the person does not humble himself before God by nature. And the nature of the person does not repent of the very nature that it knows and trusts and follows. And so there is faith that you have I can put faith in my English teacher. She says, structure a sentence thus, and that is proper English. And I say, yes, ma'am, that is proper English. And so then I structure my sentences properly. I spell my words properly. I can put faith in my math teacher. One plus one is two. Yes, math teacher, I believe you. And I, my whole life will, will align with that. But when, I comes to, when it comes to putting my faith in God, and God says to me that, that I am, by nature, a hater of God, one who does not seek after him, one that, had, that is not righteous, no, not one of us is, uh, that there's not a righteous man in all the earth who does what is right and never sins, then I'm coming to, to a point of faith 
that is beyond my ability to offer. Okay, I can offer a faith such as the faith I can put in an English teacher or a math teacher or other professors and teachers of education. But then there is a faith that I have to offer that I cannot offer because I would have to be a different person in order to be able to offer that faith. So when God then uh, regenerates me by his own election, regenerates me, why then now I have come alive. I was dead in my trespasses and sins, and now I have risen with Christ. And having risen with Christ, I now have the ability to believe on a level I wouldn't have before. Not necessarily conceptually that I couldn't have, but but as like I've said, you, you have free will, but it's limited by your nature. And so uh, unless God changes your nature, then the cap on your free will is the sin nature and the sin nature will not not allow you to repent against its own self but uh, having been regenerated now you can believe now you can hum humble yourself now you can repent on a scale that you could not have repented of before you could not have humbled before and you could not have believed before so when we're talking about these two men here, we're not talking about regenerate men. We're talking about unregenerate men. And Jesus says to them, according to your faith, it will be done. In other words, um, according to the degree to which you believe, you humble, you've humbled yourself and you morally repent, to that degree it will be done. And um, these men are given their sight back. So these two phrases that we see here is one, Jesus is saying, do you, basically, do you believe in me? Um, he's not necessarily limiting it, although the phrase limits it. He's not necessarily limiting it in con connotation to, do you believe that I can do this? but more that do you believe in me? Well, they're not able uh, to believe to you know, salvific or saving repentance. Uh, they're only able to believe up to moral repentance because that's the only kind of repentance men are capable of without supernatural intervention. Um, of course, a lot of our churches are they, they they do preach moral repentance, which is a good thing because moral repentance lays the table for saving re, uh, repentance to occur in a, and regeneration to occur in a person's life. So you do need to do that, and it really is the only thing you can ask of people. If you ask any further of them, they're just going to be frustrated at that point. But uh, you do need to point out a, a need for a repentance that is not the capacity of the human to offer so that they understand their great need for God and would call out to him for mercy. So I've, I've made a lot of hay, maybe you're thinking, of two phrases here. But I'm really not because these two phrases are key to understanding the difference between two kinds of belief. One belief is the belief in the person the other is the belief in the activity of the person. Uh, most of us would be happy with the products of Jesus, but to believe in Jesus himself? Well, that's a little harder to do. We'll, it, it, many people do say they believe in Jesus, but what they mean is they believe in who he is, they believe in what he does, and they believe in how he affects people. But do they believe in him enough to trust him with their whole life, to completely put their lives in his hands? You know, you have power over life. You have power over death. I trust you with my life. I trust you with my death. I trust you with eternity. I, I trust you so much that I'm going to become a servant and I'm going to, <coughs> I'm going to do nothing except listen for your voice, obey your commands, and continue in my daily disciplines until you give me a new command. Do I love him enough to cross that line? 
I can't do that unless he takes me and raises me from the dead. Then I can be his servant. And um, there's a degree to which Jesus is literally trying to explore that question with them. And he finds that, that they're not able to move to that level that they believe in the one doing the miracle, but they do believe the miracle can be done. And so Jesus says, well, then according to your faith, it'll be done. And they're healed. And he gives them a command immediately afterwards, right? Don't tell anybody about this. Okay. Do they pass or fail the test as to whether or not there has been salvific or saving repentance while well, they fail that test obviously uh, because they go out and they tell everybody they didn't they didn't respond as a servant response to their master they responded as a grateful stranger responds to a stranger who has done a great thing for them and they go out and they advertise everything about what he did now this, uh, God doesn't seem to condemn them for that, um, but it is to demonstrate to us a line that exists between moral repentance and saving repentance. Uh, they didn't respond as servants, they responded as strangers that had been helped. Uh, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. So uh, they didn't have faith for salvation, but they had faith for healing. And that's the lesser miracle. Make no mistake about that. Anybody who has been saved has experienced the greatest miracle that mankind will ever experience. And um, if, if you are more caught up in the lesser miracles, uh, then please take a pause and think about that. If you think getting saved is nothing more than you just kind of assenting to some truths, assenting to the idea that God is, or that Jesus is the Son of God, assenting to the idea that Jesus is capable of doing things, assenting to the ideas of these things. That's not what saving repentance is. Now, you may get moral repentance out of that, and the Bible is fine with that because the Bible wants us to be morally repentant so that we will be uh, prepared uh, as good soil for saving repentance which comes from God not from man okay so um, why would demons cause infirmities they that this, this is where I was saying I was a little bit caught up in a phrase there I'm trying to figure out if the two they's mean the same if they mean the blind men or if the first they means the blind man and the second they means the group of people that are following Christ. Uh, I was a little bit caught up in that because I don't really know. I, I don't know. I, you could read it two ways, I suppose. You could read it that the blind men went out and found this demon-possessed deaf man, and, or dumb man, I guess, and brought him into Jesus. You could read it that way. It seems to me, though, that the, that the blind men... Uh, left and were so excited have, having their sight, they were so excited that they just ran off and started telling everybody about what had happened, even though Jesus had done it in a private area, in a private place. Uh, and then the, the second they then would refer to the crowd rather than to the blind men, if that were the case. Um, Maybe it was the blind man. Maybe they went out, but I I can't tell you definitively. That was why I was like, hmm, that's interesting. I never really noticed it that way before. But uh, why would demons cause infirmities? Well, um, the human body is not supposed to house a, a demonic spirit. Um, when the Holy Spirit dwells within you, it's not the entire Holy Spirit that dwells within you. I hope you understand that. Uh, you're, like, you're like a part of Jesus' body. And the Holy Spirit, is, in a sense, is like the blood that is in a person's physical body. Now, the blood 
roams all the way through the body. It constantly is circulating through the body. And in a sense, the blood is in every part of the body and gives it life. Um, in this same sense, the Holy Spirit is within every part of the body of Christ and gives it life. That means that every body part, uh, if you will, of Christ has life in it because it has the Spirit of Christ in it, including, especially including the head who is the second person of the Trinity. Okay? So, so the Holy Spirit does not dwell fully within any one person. It could not. But a demonic spirit when it takes possession of a person, dwells fully within that person. Okay, now, dwelling fully within that person, the person, the body cannot take that kind of spiritual presence. That kind of spiritual presence is so real, it is so powerful, that it could cause infirmities. And... Uh, it, it certainly causes, I mean, we saw this with the demoniac in the Gadarenes, that it certainly causes madness and, and uh, gives a person uh, some kind of strength that is beyond the person in some cases. But in other cases, the demonic presence in a person's body makes that person sick. And in this particular case, it made this man dumb. Does it always cause infirmity? Because there are people well, that you feel may be possessed. They're so evil. Right. There are some. There are some demons that are so that the the effect is so strong on a human being that it causes infirmities. Others do not have that strong okay. uh, effect. Um, it's kind of like other sicknesses. Uh, you know, natural sicknesses. Some two people can get the flu, and one person is affected, you know, horribly by the flu, and another person is affected mildly by the flu, depending on what their body can handle. And so, in this particular case, we have a person whose body just could not handle the presence of the spirit, and it it caused him to be dumb. He couldn't bring himself to speak because of the presence of the spirit in him. So uh, Jesus drives, of course, the spirit out, and the man is able to speak again. And um, in this particular case, we see a, a spirit that causes infirmity. Um, not every spirit causes infirmity, and not every infirmity is caused by a spirit. Uh, but there are some that are, and of course, uh, I don't know that people always have the discernment to know which ones do and which ones don't. And um, if, for instance, you happen to come across somebody that has a disease and there's no medical explanation for it, it may be that there's a spiritual explanation for it. Maybe. Um, not necessarily, but maybe. Uh, how would you know? Well, if you are a believer and if you're following the Lord, uh, the Lord may tell you there's a spirit in that person. You may, you may just just know it because the Holy Spirit uh, recognizes it and causes you to recognize it. Um, but to go around and presume that people have a spirit just simply because uh, they are ill uh, is not a safe presumption at all. Um, and uh, going out looking for spirits to drive out of people is not a biblical prescription. Uh, the biblical prescription is that if God brings one to you uh, that you should confront it, you are not to have a conversation with it, just drive it out. And uh, the Holy Spirit would give you what to say in that moment. Uh, you would not be doing it just simply because you read somewhere and you thought that, and you decided that, uh, it would be because the Holy Spirit was involved in the situation. And you might drive out a spirit, but you would drive it out without really even being involved in the process other than that the Holy Spirit 
acknowledges it, pushes you to say something, and drives the, the spirit out. Um, you personally would not sit there and cognizantly weigh out the pros and the cons and have time to do all of that. It would just simply be in a moment the Holy Spirit would well up in you and you would say, you know, get out or, or leave that person or whatever you would say. And and out the demon would have to go because it's not you ordering the demon to leave. It's God ordering the demon to leave. It's interesting later on in the book of Acts that uh, the sons of, of uh, Sceva, uh, they try to drive out a demon and they say, God, uh, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who are you? Because they say, in the name of the Jesus that Paul preaches, we command you to leave. Um, wasn't such a great idea. Yeah, they got beat up, seven men by one guy, so badly that they barely escaped with their lives, the Bible says. And uh, I wouldn't suggest uh, going and messing around with spirits. Uh, it's not your place. You're the body, you're not the head. Uh, if the head wants to drive a demon out, he will come into contact with with that demon in part of his body and will drive that demon out and will do it through part of his body. But that part of his body, just like my hand, has no brain of its own. But I can, with my brain in my head, I can tell the hand, hey, do this, you know. And so the hand just does it. But the hand doesn't have a brain of its own to think through and say, I don't know if I really want to do that or not. It just has to do what I tell it to do because it's a servant. You see, and in the same way, we're supposed to be the servants of Christ. So much so that if Christ has a thought and tells a part of his body to do something, it reflexively does what the brain tells it to do. So God gave us these physical bodies to understand how the spiritual body of Christ works. Um, taking a look at the time, let's keep moving. Uh, back to Mark 6 now, and uh, verses 1 through 6. And it's just going to take me a moment to uh, make it to that passage. And here we go. Oh, that was Luke. That's not Mark. I thought I put it on Mark. It must have just kept going. Oh, for crying out loud. Just a moment. Just having a little bit of trouble here. Let's see if we can get it this time. Okay, and he went out from thence and came into his own country. And his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him? that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? Are these not his sisters that are with us? And they were offended at him, but Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went round about the villages teaching. Now, it seems that this is probably in or around the region of Nazareth. Uh, you remember that the first time he was at Nazareth, which we've already covered, I believe, at this point, uh, that they they ran him up a cliff and were going to throw him off the cliff, but he turned around and walked down past them. Um, it shows a lot of love on his part for Nazareth that he would come back to either the town or the area. His own country is all it says. And um, and would go back into the synagogue again and, and that they would even allow him to pick up... Uh, 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 a scroll and read again because originally he had read uh, to them that uh, you know that uh, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to preach good news unto the poor and and release from prisoners and you know and then he said today is this day f uh, is this scripture fulfilled in your hearing uh, they, they weren't too hip on that and 
now he comes and they're still not too hip on it. They allow him to, to preach and they're trying to figure out why is he able to do these mighty things and uh, where has he gotten uh, this I, these ideas that he's gotten about the scripture because the Pharisees are fairly consistent in what they teach about the scripture because the Pharisees teach the Talmud and whatever the Talmud says that's what they teach and um, and so it's easy to be consistent when all you're doing uh, these days we would say is just preaching a sermon you got off the internet um, it's <laughs> It's essentially the same thing, because they're they're preaching they're preaching a sermon right out of the Talmud, and uh, while some people may have worded it differently or whatever, because of their personalities or, or whatever, why it's still ultimately just them uh, teaching out of the Talmud. Whatever was written in the Talmud, here it is, and they don't go outside of the Talmud. Now the Scripture, they had no problem going outside the bounds of Scripture but they would not go outside the bounds of the Talmud. Now, it's the same thing as you move forward into uh, Catholicism when it left Christianity. Uh, it, left, it didn't leave Christianity really all at once, per se, although the seed was sown when um, Constantine came in and blended Christianity and sun worship to create peace between the Roman religion and the Christian religion. But... Um, the seed was sown, but it still took a while uh, for them to move away from sola scriptura, and they began to teach only what the church fathers had written in the uh, commentaries. And so they stayed with the commentaries, and they didn't move from the commentaries. So they were sola commentaria, <laughs> but not sola scriptura. Okay, and so just like the Pharisees before them, they had no problem leaving the bounds of the scripture, but they would not leave the bounds of the Talmud in the same way that the Catholics after them uh, had no problem leaving the scripture bounds, but they would not leave the bounds of the, of the commentaries. Okay, so here, when Jesus comes into his own country and into his own area, he's given the ability... To read, the to read in the synagogue again. He's given that. Why? Because there's people that want to see him. He's popular. You know, I mean, if you wanted to have a thousand people at your church on a Sunday morning, you know, you, you'd find some guy that it's certified that he's been going around and healing people. You're going to get a thousand people, maybe more. And, you know, so if they want good attendance at synagogue, to have Jesus come by. But the leaders of the synagogue, that's what it means that they were offended. It doesn't mean the people in the audience were offended. It means the leaders of the synagogue were offended. Remember the writing style here is such that they'll say things like, and all of Israel came out to see him when, no, they didn't. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of people. And it was like all of Israel come out, but they don't mean it that way. And they say, the Jews said unto Jesus. They don't mean every Jewish person in the crowd in unison said, you know, blah, 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 blah. It's, they didn't have like, you know, little pamphlets of, of answers out there so that all the Jews would say to him. What, he, what it means is that the leaders, the spokesmen, usually the Pharisees or the scribes, would speak up and so here that's the same thing okay so when it says that they're like like where did he get these things uh there he doesn't get it from the talmud and so they're like well where did he get these things because you know we've read the commentaries we we were we were the shul we studied we know what's going on and we've never read this before in the talmud and so they're they're really upset about this and they said with and plus Plus, he's somebody that we know. So if he was the Messiah, you see, they believe that the Messiah would just suddenly appear in the temple. I don't know where they got that, but they, they got it from a few of the Old Testament passages taken out of context, of course. But um, 
uh, but they believed that he would just that nobody would know who he was, and he would just suddenly appear in the te in the temple. And they're like, and we know. Plus, we know who this guy is. I mean, his brothers and his mother and his sisters—they're all with us here. They they we grew up with them. We know where the, who they are, and so they were offended at him. Now, at the tail end of this, and this is the I'm, I'm highlighting this part mostly in the question because. This is the part where uh, the most controversy exists. Uh, why is faith key to godly spiritual activity? Um, the earlier question that we read uh, about, uh, do you believe in me? Do you believe that I can do this? And, and then, uh, well, according to your faith, it'll be done. And they received healing, but they didn't receive repentance because they immediately go out not being servants, but, but be treating Jesus as a stranger. Um, because Jesus said, hey, don't do this. Now, if they had been servants at heart, if their hearts had been changed and they had become servants, they would have said, yes, master. But they didn't say yes, Master. And you may say, well, on a humanist level, well, of course they went out and said, who wouldn't go out and talk and tell everybody about it? Well, a person that was a servant and had been told by their master, don't tell anybody. <laughs> that would be the person that wouldn't. Okay? So, so according to their faith, it was done unto them. Okay? They had faith to be healed. That was it. They didn't have faith, though, to salvation. And in the same sense here, we have a people that are willing to admit that he has read the scripture to them, but as far as his teaching of the scripture, the teaching of the scripture was all about Christ. Well, it is. I mean, the entire Old Testament is about Christ. The entire New Testament for us is all about Christ as well. And so Christ is standing there right in the middle of them all, and he's talking to them about himself, and they're offended. He didn't get this from the commentaries. He didn't get the, you know, the Talmud. He, he didn't get this, uh, you know, he didn't get this uh, because he's the Messiah, because if he were, we wouldn't know who he was, but we do. He grew up among us. He was, you know, Mary's his mother, and Judas, and Simon, and Joseph, and the, these are all his brothers, and over here we know his sisters, and and so they're offended at him. And the scripture says that it was because of their lack of faith that he was not able to do anything except heal a few sick people. Now, that doesn't mean, and this is where we have to get into this a little bit, okay? This does not mean that our faith activates the power of God. That's not what it means, okay? Okay? What it means here is that they didn't even have faith for moral repentance. They didn't even have that. And he was so astonished at their lack of faith. Why? Because he grew up there. He grew up in a town where it was Jewish and everybody talked about the scripture and, and wondered about the Messiah and talked about what they had heard at synagogue that week and and uh, you know the the conversation about the religion was central to everything. He grew up there and they literally did not have even enough faith to to be morally repentant. Jesus had no effect on them whatsoever. And this is why Jesus said, only in his hometown and among his own kin is a prophet without honor. They didn't have even enough belief for healing. Now, that's a different view than what the humanist Christians are, or Christian humanists are putting on this particular passage. The Christian humanists are putting onto this package, uh, the, the ones who are mystical are putting onto this package the idea that, uh, that it was that they did not understand that their faith would activate uh, God's power and so because they didn't have faith, God's power was not able to flow to them. That's not it at all. Um, it is because 
they didn't even have enough faith to repent morally, uh, let alone salvifically. And where we have the story which occurs chronologically, although not, not in Mark per se, but Matthew, um, the story that we have that affects it chronologically and it brings the context is the context of two kinds of repentance. Do you believe in me? The one who, do you believe I'm able to do this? Uh, well, well, sure, sure. Yeah, we know that you can do that. Okay. Well, Jesus says, well, according to your faith, it'll be done. Because he knew their hearts. He knew their hearts. He knew that, that, that they had faith to a point. And so he said, well, okay, to your, according to your faith, it'll be done. And so they were, they were healed, but they were not healed of their sin. They were not healed of their sin nature. And uh, it demonstrated, of course, in the fact that he gave them a command, which is the test. And the test is God gives you a command. Do you obey it? And so they go out and they obey. They disobey it and they treat him like a stranger, which shows the difference between the two, you know, why Jesus asked the question and shows why there was the follow-up. Now here we see even more so how a lack of even human faith, apart from saving faith, a lack of even human faith exists among his own people because they're so familiar with Jesus. They saw him grow up as a kid. They're so familiar with him. They don't even, he doesn't even affect them for the most basic of repentance, which is moral. And moral repentance isn't enough to save you, but it is enough to set the table for regeneration. It doesn't even, they don't even get that much. They don't even go that far. But there are still a few sick people in that area that, uh, that have faith towards moral repentance enough that they are willing. They, they believe, they're humble, they're repentant, and they have those three factors of faith, and they are able to, to put their faith in the Lord for their healing. And so he gives them healing. But he walks away completely dumbfounded at the fact that uh, these folks have completely rejected, uh, not, just, not just to the point at which they're unable to help, which is that repentance which only comes after regeneration, but they can't even repent on a moral level which is the level that John the Baptist was calling people to as he was preparing the way for the Lord and making straight paths for his feet, getting rid of all of the moral filth, getting rid of all of the, all of, all of the things that men can make restitution for, that men can uh, repent of morally. Why, John the Baptist had a tremendous ministry preparing the table for Christ and when Christ comes in he says behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world which is like okay the work that I've done here's the one that brings you to the next step I baptize with water he'll baptize with Holy Spirit and fire okay two kinds of repentance I baptize for moral repentance to set the table for this Lamb of God which comes to take you to the next level and therefore, we have uh, we have these questions about faith that are peppered within the uh, the testimonies of miracles that were done. Unfortunately, because of Christian humanism, uh, both mystical and practical, uh, practical Christian humanism, of course, would dismiss the miraculous and find natural ways of explaining it. And in that respect, uh, there is a division between the mystical humanist which is uh, mostly found in the charismatic and the Pentecostal circles, but uh, also, also in some Calvinist circles and also in some Arminian circles as well. Um, but the mystical humanist, uh, you know, believes that the miracles of God, uh, that God has given man the power to activate those things and to make them happen. The natural Christian humanist would say that, that God has... has uh, 
given us each other and science and knowledge and such so that uh, so that miracles uh, can happen in the providential sense and in, in certain cases they're actually kind of right but they're so they're the only right in a philosophical sense so you can't you, you can't entrust yourself to them uh, because the scripture is what you're supposed to entrust yourself to and as I said earlier why uh, we're not in the business of speaking sola commentaria <laughs> we're in the business of speaking sola scriptura <laughs> and the commentaries in the Talmud they unfortunately have no problem uh, leaving the bounds of scripture to bring in uh, psychological sociological anthropological and other kind of logical types of, of human thought to explain the scripture and so they immediately subject the scripture to man's understanding which is a violation of Proverbs 3 5 and 6 well we are at the end of our hour. So glad we were able to talk about this tonight. I hope that some of this has put things into perspective. Okay, I am not poo-pooing faith at all, but we are defining faith biblically. We are not at all setting aside that God does miracles, for he still does miracles even today. Um, but he does not do them at the uh, pace that he did at first because the original miracles were given to him as signs even as they were given to Moses as signs and uh, so the signs and wonders types of miracles have have uh, ceased because the the need for them has ceased but God still does miracles but not as not not as a means to gain the confidence of the crowd now he doesn't do that anymore because we have the scripture it was completed when John wrote Revelation and uh, now it is for us to to demonstrate in the scripture the power of God and we do that but the Holy Spirit still lives with us still lives within us still talks to us still moves us still does things that need to be done through us because we are the body of Christ uh, mystical in some sense as uh, Charles Wesley put it uh, mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one he called it in uh, church is one foundation so anyways let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and uh, I thank you for coming tonight to your computer or your TV or whatever it is you're using to watch us tonight let's pray thank you father for this time to speak the word thank you Lord for the clarity I ask God your hand upon me and upon those that are watching that we might truly serve you, Lord, in accordance with the life you have given to us. Let us not, I pray, walk as the heathen do, but let us walk, Lord, as those that have been rescued from sin. We thank you, Lord, for gifts of healing, and we thank you, Lord, for the signs and the wonders of the New Testament and the record that we have of them that proves to us that Jesus is your Messiah. Help us to walk uh, in the faith that those miracles uh, produce in us even as the miracle of the crossing of the Red Sea so long ago still produces faith within us we ask God that you would be with those that we are praying for and that Lord you would help us to win many souls to you in Jesus name Lord we pray amen all right well have a good night uh, it was nice to see you on this icy Thursday evening and uh, we expect to see you again next week so uh, don't worry about that but in two weeks it's gonna be Christmas season and I will be with my family that Thursday night but still next week so don't go anywhere we'll see you Sunday if you come to church and if you don't or can't why then we will see you hopefully on Facebook live on Sunday uh, and then next Thursday as well okay bye bye <music>